Hey, super quick, before we dive into this episode, I want to share with you a belief that I have. I want to see if you share this belief with me. You see, I believe that we as real estate entrepreneurs should get to grow our real estate portfolios, our rental portfolios at the rate that we want to, not at the rate that a bank or the marketplace tells us that we can. See, when I talk to real estate entrepreneurs, which I have the privilege of doing so often, really there's three problems that come up when I ask them, what are they encountering when they try to scale? And they say there's three things. Number one is they have to have access to deals that actually make sense and they're having trouble doing that. Number two, they're having trouble getting access to enough loans to be able to buy those properties. And then even if they had both the access to deals and the loans, they don't feel like they have enough access to cash. And those three reasons are why I created a new program called Deals. So here's the deal with deals, pun intended. Yes, absolutely. Of course I would do that. This is a group coaching program with a structured curriculum that is all about leading you through the linear process of creating an off-market acquisition system for seller financing deals so that you're not limited by what the market has to offer you, not limited by what the banks will give you, and shows you also some new, fresh, alternative ways you can generate cash to do the deals you need. Now, look, I know that deals is not for everybody, and that's totally okay. So if you think the deals program is the right fit to help you get where you're trying to go in your portfolio, Go to thoughtfulre.com slash deals. And on that page, you'll see a little description of the program. And if you are interested, just hit the button where you can start a conversation. I would definitely want to personally ask you a few questions and make sure that you are a fit because I know it's not for everybody and that is a okay. So head on over to thoughtfulre.com slash deals to find out about this group coaching program to help you slay those three problems that we have when we try to scale access to deals, access to the right loans, and access to cash. All right, on with today's episode. Real estate investing is a get rich slow or get rich for sure business. It's not get rich quick. Uh, It starts as a trickle that becomes a stream that then becomes a raging river. All right, Our, our journey to financial freedom, the first 12 years were interesting, but not outstanding. It was those last three or four years that like, it's like, oh my God, We really can do this thing. Welcome to Racking Up Rentals, a show about how regular people, those of us without huge war chests of capital or insider connections, can build lasting wealth acquiring a portfolio of buy and hold real estate. But we don't just go mainstream looking at what's on the market and asking banks for loans, nor are we posting we buy houses signs or just looking for, quote, motivated sellers to make lowball offers to. You see, we are people oriented deal makers. We sit down directly with sellers to work out win-win deals without agents or any other obstacles and buy properties nobody else even knows are for sale. I'm Jeff from The Thoughtful Real Estate Entrepreneur. If you're the kind of real estate investor who wants long-term wealth, not get-rich-quick gimmicks or pictures of yourself holding fat checks on social media, this show is for you. Join me and quietly become the wealthiest person on your block. Now let's go rack up a rental portfolio. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Racking Up Rentals. Show notes for this episode, including a full transcript of the interview you're about to hear, can be found at thoughtfulre.com slash E122. Please do us a big favor by hitting the subscribe button in your podcast app. I so appreciate that. It obviously helps you make sure you don't miss the next episode, but believe it or not, it sends a message back to the podcast platforms that tells them that people are listening and it makes them want to spread the show to others. So thank you for subscribing and following this show. Onward with today's episode. And in today's episode, I'm really excited to share with you an interview I did very recently with Michael Zuber. Now, I think I might have been the only real estate investor on the planet who had not read his book, One Rental at a Time, but I kept seeing people reference it in Facebook groups and forums. And then I was chatting with our our mutual friend, Dion McNeely, a guest from just a couple episodes ago, who mentioned Michael and mentioned that they were collaborating. And so Dion was gracious enough to make an introduction between Michael and I. And I started checking out his book and I thought, wow, I can see why people are really into this. So I was really excited to get a chance to chat with Michael. We had a great conversation and you are about to hear it. So I will shut up now. Stop blabbing. Let's get right to the interview with Michael Zuber. 
Okay. Michael Zuber, thanks for joining us on the racking up rentals. Oh, thank you, Jeff. This should be fun. Yeah, no, I've, I've been looking forward to this and I want to give a public thanks to our mutual friend, Dion McNeely, who was also on my show recently uh, for this great introduction. And you, you two have known each other for a few months. Yeah, we have. He's a, he's a big part of my channel. We actually have a Thursday conversation called the three amigos where Dion is a part of it. Actually, we recorded that this morning. Uh, So every Thursday, yeah, we spend an hour together and uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. That's awesome. So if I back up before Dion introduced us, um, I first heard about you through Facebook groups Mm -hmm. and here's what kept happening. Somebody would ask a question and then somebody else would respond and they would say something to the effect of, well, Michael Zuber would say, yeah. A blank, you know, and I and I was like, huh, interesting. And then I saw that again and again and again, and you know, then it, and it came up with Dion. And so my first question for you, Michael, is uh, you are clearly doing something that is striking a chord with people. Like, oh. what is it about you? Know, you, your smashing good looks, your ah. the name <laughs> of the book. I don't know, whatever it is. What what is what is resonating so well with people? I, well, I think there's there's hopefully there's a couple of things. Um, First and foremost, one rental at a time is nothing more than than our story of cons- living below our means, one rental at a time. Uh, we actually do the business. We don't just talk about it. There's lots of people out there that just read books and talk like they're an expert. We've been doing this 20 years. Uh, we, we were buying before the bubble, during the bubble, after the bubble, and we're still buying today, um, You know, so people appreciate that. And I believe... I believe real estate success, investment success is really a couple of things. First, it's focus. Most new investors don't focus. Uh, I believe in daily discipline. Uh, Like Dion, I bought my entire portfolio out of the multiple listing service or MLS or today's world, Realtor, Redfin, Zillow, things of that nature. Um, Since retiring, I've done, I have certainly bought off market and and done those things, but uh, our portfolio was built one deal at a time. And I think people like that. And I don't preach high leverage. Uh, In fact, I think it is very dangerous. Why? Because again, I've been doing it 20 years and I saw people worth $10 million go bankrupt in under a year because they had high leverage. You know, uh, you know, people see Dave Ramsey today and, you know, he's worth $300 million. Right. But again, he went bankrupt in real estate because he was, he wasn't even highly leveraged, right? He had $4 million in real estate, 3 million in debt, but he had the wrong debt. He had 90 day debt. Um, and I talk about 30 year money only, right? So I hope, I hope it's resonating because people see my path is achievable, right? Dion's path is achievable. Uh, we're not selling smoke and mirrors. And again, we do this business every day. I look at my market every day, even after 20 years. So I'm hoping that's the reason. Yeah. Yeah. Th- that's been my sense. That's kind of what I was, if I had to have my own theory, even from the name of the book through some of the ideas I've heard, you know, you express already today and then some other people reflect in some of those groups and whatnot. It does. It's, it, I think you've done an amazing job of making it seem very doable, very real for a regular, a regular person who's not suddenly going to just uh, given their notice. And then the next day they're like, well, I guess I'll figure out real estate investing. Yeah. I'm a full-time real estate investor. Well, did you know that you're not bankable? You have no emergencies. You you're, you're soon going to be in so much stress that your family relationship's going to blow up. And uh, I I'm far more conservative, right? I, um, I believe bust your butt during the day. Uh, I work 60, 70, 80 hours a day, but I still found time to uh, look at my market every day. You know, we, we were raising a child. So I had, I had, I had all the demands that most of us have and it still worked. It did take 15 years, but you know, retiring at 45 is certainly better than 65 or 70. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would agree. I think most people would, would you mind giving us a little snapshot of some of the daily disciplines that you, that you Mm -hmm. like to advocate? Yeah. Again, what I, I think step one is focus. So it starts there. I call it a buy box. I try to simplify everything and create stories because stories, people remember stories. Yeah. So first off uh, with a lot of new investors, they're all over the map, right? They can't even, they can't even decide on what market, let alone what asset type, right? If you're a new investor and you're looking in Texas one day, Ohio, the next day, Michigan, the next day, then Washington, you're not going to get anywhere. Because all of those markets are different. 
let alone, though all those states are different, let alone the submarket of each area. So the first thing I say is get laser focused. Um, so I always use my example because when in doubt, I tell what I did. So I, I live in California. California is huge. Uh, I live in this the city of Mountain View, which if you don't know where that is, that's called generally called the Bay Area or the Silicon Valley. It's ridiculously expensive here. It doesn't make sense for cash flow. So I had to find a market two and a half hours away, and I found Fresno, California 20 years ago, and I never left. But even Fresno is too big. So Fresno, let's call it a million, right? It's a million houses. Um, I had to pick a zip code. I, I chose 93703. It's called the Mayfair. And even that was too big. I had to pick three bedroom or four bedroom homes between 12 and 1600 square feet. That is all I looked at for three years, Jeff. Everything else was a, I don't know, didn't exist. I didn't do, look at duplexes. I didn't look at quads. I didn't look at apartments. I didn't look at condos. I didn't look at lots. I didn't look at mobile homes. I looked at three or four bedrooms between 12 and 1600 square feet and one zip code for three years. That's focus. That's daily discipline. And then I looked 20 minutes a day, seven days a week. In 20 years, Jeff, I may have missed 10 days. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you made it easy and doable for yourself, right? Because your, your focus basically facilitated um, less friction, right? Because you, yeah. you didn't have to decide every morning, like, oh, I wonder what I should look at today. If you no already day, knew. Yep. yep. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I love that. And I, I too am... I hear a lot and it always makes me really uncomfortable with people who talk about doing business like all over the place. Like there's all mm -hmm. sorts of people who say, well, if the numbers work, I don't really care where it is or this or that. And, and I think, man, I, I just, to paraphrase what you just said in a way that I think about it, like, I want to be like the world's foremost authority on my tiny, tiny little sandbox. Like, and that could be a geographic, a tiny geographic sandbox. It could be a product type within that sandbox. It could be a, you know, a, I don't know, a tenant type even within that sandbox, yeah. but it's like, you got to be the the world's foremost authority on something. And that, that focus results in that. I couldn't agree more, especially if you, the people that resonate with me typically have full-time jobs and are raising kids. Yeah. You really only have one option because if you choose not to be this focused, you're, you're, you're actually going to get what I call negative leverage because trust me, when you look at Texas and then Michigan, you'll be confused. Mm -hmm. You'll have, it'll actually be negative as opposed to positive because, oh my God, what, what was Texas tax rate versus Michigan tax rate? What's section eight limit versus, ah, I'm confused. Yeah. Most people do it to themselves. So I preach, talk about step one, buy box focus. And again, I looked at that one little buy box for three years mm -hmm. before I felt comfortable expanding it at all. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the other thing that focus does, of course, is it, it either, um, preempts or solves the idea of overwhelm. And I don't know what your experience has been, but mine is definitely that if there's, if you can sort of broadly pin, you know, procrastination or stalling or whatever on one thing, it's probably overwhelm for many investors. And that's what I love about what you're saying there. Yeah. It, what you do with focus is by like day 10 or 15, you're like, Oh, okay. I, I'm starting to get a rhythm by day 45 or 60. You're actually knowing that buy box better than 99.9% .9 of agents in that market. And yeah, you called it a sandbox. I agree. I want to know that sandbox better than anybody else because my whole goal with teaching or mentoring or whatever it is, is I want you to learn average. I want you to know what the average deal is inside that sandbox because the power in what I've done over the years is I never do average. I learn average, but I only learn average so I can find good or great deals, right? Dion says, and I agree, it's always a great time to do a great deal. I don't believe in timing the market. I believe that's shot, that's just foolish in real estate. It's always a great time to do a great deal, but you don't know great until you've looked at the sandbox and you could say, hey, Jeff, for a three-bedroom or four-bedroom house in the Mayfair district between 12 and 1,600 square feet, the average yield is 6.5%. Yeah. Then you can go find eights or nines or create eights and nines by negotiation or seller financing or seller seconds or whatever it is. But yeah. until you've spent the time and no average, you're gambling at best. Yeah. You got to have, you have to have that point of reference to know how, how to judge new things that come into your radar screen based on like what that, mm -hmm. that middle marker of average is. Yeah. I like that a lot. So I just thought of a question I did not plan to ask you, but you know, you just mentioned, I know my, my focus, my buy box, my focus area. 
mm-hmm. better than the realtors. Mm-hmm. So I, I know that you've bought a lot of properties through realtors. And mm-hmm. so my question actually that comes out of this is like, if you know it better than the realtors, I think that's a great, great, great thing. So what role in your mind do realtors play mm-hmm. in your overall efforts? Because in, in a way, it's sort of like we're saying, it's not necessarily ex- market expertise of that exact product type in that exact area because you know it better than them. So if mm-hmm. it's not that, like what, what is the role that they play for you that adds tremendous value for you? Well, first and foremost, the number one thing you should be doing with any real estate agent and frankly, any investor is telling them what your buy box is. So every real estate agent I ever meet, like the third thing we say is this, I basically tell them what I buy. Because real estate agents will get access to deals, pocket listings, they will have walk-in appointments, they have past relationships. They hear things and they get paid for telling other people what's happening. So I want every agent in Fresno, California to know what I buy. Um, most of the deals I've done through this pandemic came from relationships, not on the MLS. It's been, it's been impossible to find a good deal on the multiple listing the last 18 months. But you know what? I spent 20 years telling people what I buy and I closed eight or 10 deals because people go, hey, Mike buys that stuff. Yeah. So real estate agents are tremendously valuable for investors like me because I would, again, in the beginning, I would say I buy in the Mayfair district, the threes or fours between this one story. Yeah. And they would call me. They would call me first. They don't want to put it on the MLS. They would love to double in. And I let them. Yeah. Right. So that's mainly what it is. And then they obviously, uh, I don't live in my market. And, you know, again, Fresno is two and a half hours away. So I've worked with some agents and we've done it enough times where they can be my initial walkthrough and they'll do a, you know, now they do FaceTime for me. Right. I haven't been in Fresno in almost two years uh, and we're still doing 15, 20 deals um, since then. So ag- agents are, hugely valuable to me. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about your acquisition strategy then. And Mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about what, what strategy are you using for financing, right? Cause you've gotten to a scale and a pace that you don't just walk in and ask for a Fannie (laughs) Freddie type of loan, right? (laughs) So what's your approach to that these days? So these days uh, I'm lucky enough to be doing this 20 years. So I have, um, I have equity lines that I can use if it's very short term money. I can go get non-QM money, which is non-qualified mortgage, like five, five and an eighth, 30 year fixed. So that's cool for me. Yeah. I can't get Fannie Freddie's at threes. I can do commercial financing portfolio loans. I have options. I also have access to millions of dollars in private money. Uh, if I, cause I've done this uh, so long that I have a list of people that are willing to lend to me. So money's not, not a challenge. I just can't get three or 4%, right? The lowest rate I can get uh, pretty regularly is five and a quarter. Mm-hmm. I see. And are you mostly buying properties where there's some kind of value add component, like physically or managerially, or are they a little bit more turnkey or a mix? Or I, I will buy whatever makes sense. I would say his, the last 18 months, they have been seller situations. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I bought a portfolio about a year and a half ago, uh, seller financing, right? They were, um, it was actually before the pandemic, right before it started. I think it was November of 19 and he needed to close in December. So seller financing was the only way to do it. So we bought, um, I want to be right. So I, it's two fourplexes, a triplex and four houses. So four, 11, 15, yeah, 15 units. One guy, seller financing. He's like, hey, Michael, you bought one of my units two years ago. You're manning your words. You closed on time at price, didn't, didn't retrade me. Uh, I want to sell everything. And um, I'm willing to give you a great price, meaning a huge equity, but I need a, I need a 10-year prepayment penalty because he just wants to, he wants the payments for 10 years. I'm like, cool, let's work something out. So lo and behold, he got his payments for 10 years at the number he wanted. And I walked away with half a million bucks in equity uh, because I won't, I, won't, uh, I won't sell any of them uh, for 10 years or I won't refi them. Again, conversations with sellers, it's important to listen, stop talking. Most, I've been selling for 20 years. Most people talk too much, right? The whole, you have two ears and one mouth, yeah. shut up and listen. Yeah. Uh, and it's amazing what happens. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I wish I wish we had ten years in one mouth because that's about the ratio I, yeah. I think it should be. You know, it's like, dude, you should be talking about ten percent of the time. Uh, and I actually, I'll, I also tell my my audience and my like coaching clients that in any meeting with a seller, I want you to learn ten times about them as they learn about you. Like, and that goes right along with the listening side of things too, in terms of just like knowing your audience. Yeah, and, and again, a little word of advice: whenever you can, don't ask yes or no questions. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. Get a story feelings. And again, I've been selling for a long time and, and people don't really understand this. And if, if you're not a salesperson, you may not get it, uh, but it's true. People buy emotionally, but justify logically. Mm-hmm. People think selling, right? A lot of the salespeople I meet that are horrible want to make it about ROI or the return or logic. Right. You don't start with logic. You got to grab their heart first yep. and then their mind. Most people do it ass backwards. Yeah, I oh man, totally, totally agree with you on that. Um, okay. So, okay. So you started doing this and it was going very, very well for you. What made you want to uh, transition some of your focus to then helping show other people how you do what you do? Like what made you want to write a book and do all the things you do? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, so again, I was a sales guy for 20 years. I live in a profession that you literally can be fired every 90 days. In addition to that, every year we get new accounts, we get new technology, new quotas. And it came to a situation where I did not like what I was getting. Uh, I went to work that day thinking I was going to have a great year because I've had 20 great years and it came out and I'm like, Nope, you don't like me. I don't like you. We're done. I'm out. Uh, so I retired, uh, on a day that I didn't expect to. So then you spend two days wildly excited, right? You've been sacrificing for 15 years. It's finally time to recoup the rewards. I, I smiled so much, Jeff, my face hurt. <laughs> However, then the mind starts doing what the mind does. I'm a type A, highly motivated, goal-oriented individual. And now I have nothing to do. I start getting depressed. It starts to spiral. I've never been a negative person. You can't really be in sales as long as I was and be negative, right? You always have to keep leaning forward like it's possible, it's possible. Possible. And I was I was in a dark space. And it finally came down to a Friday. I just came back from some meetings in San Francisco uh, where I was, I was going to get a job Monday. Not because I needed the money, but because I wanted to stop being depressed. I wanted to feel like I was contributing. So I had to self, I had to self-reflect. And um I remember reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I started, and as I talk about in my book, and I'm like, there's not a book out there about a full-time employee who reads Rich Dad, Poor Dad, does it for 15 years and wins or finishes or whatever that is. I'm like, you know what? I need to write that book. I need to write that story. So that became the thing to do. So you write a book, it takes whatever it takes. And out of that book became, hey, Maybe I can talk on, maybe I can do this YouTube thing. I don't know what it is, but I have experience. I have questions. Let's try YouTube. So basically what it, what it came down to is I found a way to feel like I'm contributing in the morning. My, my mornings usually are over by 1030. And then the rest of the day is mine to do with what I want. So the book, the YouTube, a second book that's coming out in another couple of weeks is really my way of giving back and feel like I'm, I feel like I'm still contributing as opposed to that horrible feeling of being depressed. Yeah. Yeah. Totally understand that. Somebody pointed out to me uh, many years ago that the word, you know, retire really means like to take something out of service. And it's like, yeah. oh, I don't want to be taken out of service. I, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like true. being put out to pasture, you know, like, no, no, I don't, I don't want that at all. I might want to stop doing what I'm doing now in favor of doing something else, but yes. Um, yeah, that's cool. I can definitely relate to that, that desire. Well, I think it's safe to say there are thousands if not more people who are glad you, uh, you made that decision. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I guess one of the things I encounter a lot is people who feel stuck, right? Maybe mm. stuck, like taking the first step, maybe they've taken a few steps and they're stuck mm. at the, you know, the fifth Fannie Freddie loan. Sure. They've, maybe they've gotten 10, they're stuck there. Maybe it's a mentality stuck. Mm-hmm. What, what do you find from you? Cause you get to talk to a whole lot of people too. Like, mm-hmm where do people get stuck most? And then how do they get through that? Oh, um, I think most people get stuck because they want it too fast, right? Real estate investing is a get rich slow or get rich for sure business. It's not get rich quick. Uh, It starts as a trickle that becomes a stream that then becomes a raging river. All right. Our, Our journey to financial freedom, the first 12 years were, interesting, but not outstanding. Mm -hmm. It was those last three or four years that like, it's like, Oh my God, we really can do this thing. Um, I think most people, especially today. And again, the beauty of my journey starts really before social media, right? All right. 
I actually had to go to a bookstore to buy books, not Amazon, right? <laughs> um, so I think I think too many people let social media, instant gratification, microwave wealth, uh, lying, frankly, distort them. That's why I talk about daily discipline, focus, moving forward. Lots of people get stuck with money, but you know what? Slow down. Um, you know, save a little money. Live. I, I tell the story, right? At 30 years old, before I buy our first house, I was making six figures and spending it all. Mm-hmm. By the time we're 32, uh, we're living on 50% of our income. And we did that for a decade. Yeah. You know, uh, it takes discipline to do this. The financial being, having a better financial future is actually pretty easy. It just takes choices and daily disciplines. Financial freedom is hard because that that is also time. But having a better financial future really isn't that hard. It's just nobody wants to do it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So to wrap it up, I thought for fun, I want to give you a couple uh, like rapid fire questions. Just a bit on the lark. I've never done this before. Sure. But about 20 minutes before you and I got on here, uh, I posted on Facebook and I said, hey, I'm about to uh, interview Michael Zuber. What do you want me to make sure I ask him? And I oh, got a couple wow. responses. Okay. <laughs> oh, sweet. So, uh, first one comes from Samuel and he's asking if you're willing to share, sure. uh, how many units do you have now? And what is your recommendation on cash reserves per unit? So I have a lot, I have well over a hundred units. Um, I don't think in cash reserves per unit at that level. Uh, I have a, I have a set of cash set aside that covers me just fine. However, in the beginning, Samuel, uh, I wanted to have five thousand dollars for the first house, then four thousand for the second, and then three thousand. Uh, once I got to about ten thousand bucks in the beginning, uh, that was plenty of reserves. Uh, my reserves is more than that today, but you know, a lot more units. So, um, yeah. And again, I I treat these reserves as money I don't have. I actually, in the beginning, I opened up a separate bank account in a separate location only for the reserves. Uh, I think a couple of people in the past got in trouble because, oh, I got the deal of a lifetime. Let me just use my reserves. And then they had a roof leak or a water heater blow up and they didn't have the money. So I treat reserves as just what they are is, is for emergencies. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. And and one more um, from Ekaterina. She's asking, do you have a favorite deal you've done and something that you feel kind of most proud of? Yeah. Um, so these people, I I remember reading books, right? Again, I read books, bought at Amazon and everybody talks about a no money down deal. So I did a no money down apartment deal at the depth of the recession, right? So, or the, yeah, the real estate recession. So we bought an 18 unit building that had once sold for 1.5 million. Uh, We bought it for 700 grand. Uh, We got it entirely financed by the lender. We got a reduced rate. And all I had to do was put up, put $50,000 in escrow so that we could, rip, you know, the units, they needed 50 to 60 grand. And we got that by relationships. Uh, we had done another deal on a house with the bank. The bank knew what we were looking for. Again, as I told you earlier, I tell everybody what we're looking to buy. And the bank calls us up and says, hey, we got this unit. You know, they wanted, I think, initially like 900. We, I walked it with the bank president. That was really fun. I couldn't believe he was walking through all 18 units in his full three piece suit. It was, it was, it got caught, it got comical and I didn't need to see him all, but I just wanted to see if he'd make it. Um, so yeah, that was fun. And you know, five years later we refight him out, put a bunch of equity away. It's, it's yeah. Zero down apartment deals can happen, but they don't happen nearly as often as people think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, that's a great one. Well, any final words? I, I want to make sure people know exactly where to find you, mm-hmm. uh, exactly how to get the book and, and everything else that you do and how to mm-hmm. access the YouTube channel. What's the best way to... Yeah, I, I think I'm out there pretty well. If you just go to your Google search bar and type in one rental at a time, you will see a YouTube website, book, Instagram. Uh, that, that should be the way. Uh, and as far as leaving people with advice, all I'm trying to do is I want people to believe it's possible. My first book is is a story of two full-time employees raising a child and getting there. The next book is 15 stories of other people from other situations doing amazing things in real estate. You have to focus. Daily discipline takes time, but it is absolutely possible. Don't rush it. Keep going. You know, one day at a time, you can get there. Yeah, beautiful. I love it. Thank you so much for taking some time to join us on Racking Up Rentals. Thank you, buddy. 
There you have it. My conversation with Michael Zuber. I really just, I like his approach and his mentality. And he really, I think, gives us all permission to feel like we don't have to be just blasting down the freeway of financial independence. So we can get there in a very predictable and dependable and safe manner by just doing things. Well, you know, to use his words, one rental at a time. I think he made so many great points about the buy box concept and the focus that that brings and just the daily disciplines and and so much. So I got a ton out of that. I really hope you did as well. It's been really fun to be telling people that I was interviewing Michael and that this episode was coming and to hear so many people say things like, oh my gosh, you know, my worlds are colliding within real estate. You know, I follow you, Jeff, and your message, but I also been really listening and reading and loving Michael's stuff. And so I am uh, very excited that those two worlds could collide in this way also. So that's a wrap for today's episode of Racking Up Rentals. Again, show notes, including a transcript, are going to be found at thoughtfulre.com slash E122. Please do us a big favor by hitting that subscribe button in your podcast app and rating and reviewing the show. Did you know that we have a Facebook group for thoughtful real estate entrepreneurs too? It's called Rental Portfolio Wealth Builders, and we would love to have you join us over there. Just go to group.thoughtfulre.com, and the magic of the internet will redirect you right to that page within Facebook, and you can hit the join button. If you like this episode, please take a screenshot of it, post the screenshot to Instagram, and tag us in your post. We are at Thoughtful Real Estate, all nice and spelled out. I will see you in the next episode. Until then, this is Jeff from the Thoughtful Real Estate Entrepreneur signing off. Thanks for listening to Racking Up Rentals, where we build long-term wealth by being win-win deal makers. Remember, solve the person to unlock the deal and solve the financing to unlock the profits. 